Hello friends, I'm Jonathan Little. Maybe we're back, maybe we're not. Today we're talking about how to make, well, how to build a $100,000 bankroll. My webcam just died. I don't know why my webcam died. Sometimes things die, such as life. We do have a backup webcam here, just in case. Looks like uh, we will not be needing that at the moment. It's always unnerving when your computer just doesn't function properly. We'll give all of you a few more minutes to trickle back in. While you're trickling back in, I'm gonna go through the points I already did so this video can stand alone. Two, make money from poker. All you have to do is find a game you can beat, play that game a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. You can find a game you can beat by studying a ton and getting very good at poker. Or you can find bad players to play with. Either one, you do not even have to be good at poker in order to make money. You just have to find players you can beat. Next, you gotta play the game a lot. And finally, you have to keep a proper bankroll so you can withstand the inevitable swings of poker. Ideally, especially when you're growing your bankroll, you keep variance low so you don't risk going broke. Because if you go broke, you can't make any more money. Huge congrats to Louis Philippe, by the way. Louis Philippe runs our poker coaching study sessions. He just passed, I believe, 500 subscribers on YouTube. Good job, good work. They've been crushing the games in the poker coaching study sessions, and I'm very, very proud of all of them. All right, it is a math problem at the end of the day. Suppose you can make $1 per hour playing poker. You can do this at five cent, 10 cent, no limit hold'em. You can do this at $5 buy-in sit and goes. It's not that difficult to make $1 playing poker. Okay. All you have to do is put in a lot of time. It will take you 100 hours to make 100 more dollars. It'll take you 100 hours to make 100 more dollars. You will have turned your 100 into 200. 100 hours is two and a half weeks of play. If you play 40 hours a week. If you really like poker, like I used to like poker, I would play about 80 hours a week. That means I'll double my bankroll every week and a half. Imagine the power to be able to double your money every week and a half. We talked about this earlier that, you know, once you start getting a hold of a lot of money, you can't necessarily double your, lot of, your piles of money. But if you can double your money every week and a half, if you play a ton or every two weeks, or even every three or four weeks, if you take it kind of slow, that is quite powerful. So once you double your bankroll is $200, assuming you're good at poker, assuming you're studying, assuming you're working hard and you're actually better than your opponents, which is a, a big caveat there. Now you'll be able to make roughly $2 an hour. Well, now it'll take you 100 hours to get to a $400 bankroll. Okay. Well, now can we find a way to make $4 an hour? Turns out you can. You can just keep moving up. And it, the fortunate thing about poker especially in 2023, is that the games are not actually all that much more difficult as you move up from the tiniest stakes to the medium stakes. Now, once you get to the high stakes, the games get quite tough, but it's not difficult to turn a little bit of money into a pretty good amount of money. So you do this 10 times. 100 times 2 is 200, times 2 is 400, times 2 is 800, times 2 is 16, times 2 is 32, times 2 is 64, then 12,800, then 26,000, 25,600, 51,200, then up to $100,000. This will take you a 1,000 hours, which can be played in roughly half of a year. Not a whole lot of time to turn $100 into $100,000. So why don't more people do this? Seems so easy, right? Well, first things first, most people don't even know where to start. They flounder around, they don't study, and they try to treat poker like a get-rich-quick scheme. They want to play tournaments that have a lot of variance. And look, nothing wrong with tournaments. I play a lot of tournaments. But there's a reason for that, right? The reason is because as you move up to the highest stakes, cash games become very, very difficult to find where you can make a substantial amount of money. So you have to play tournaments. but Whenever you're first starting, your goal should not be to get rich quick and turn $5 into $1,000 or $10,000. Your goal should be to find a game you can beat and you can win a dollar an hour. That's it. That's all you need to do to get started. And the great thing about a dollar per hour is that you're actually winning. And even if you don't ever become a pro, you at least have a good hobby where you can make a little bit of money on the side. Now, a dollar an hour is not a whole lot of money. I get it. But if you can make a dollar an hour playing poker, you can probably make $5 an hour playing poker in reality. And $5 an hour is, and look, it's not much money, but it's not bad for a hobby, right? I mean, it sounds pretty sweet to me. So 
you want to find a game where you have an edge that you can actually play a lot. Another big benefit of cash games and sit and goes in particular is that you can play them to some extent whenever you want. Now, sit and goes are kind of dead in 2023, which is why I don't even really teach them at pokercoaching.com because I want to make sure I teach all of you games that actually have a good future. Games that I think you'll be able to make money from long term. You got to realize at the end of the day, I am not teaching my students to play poker for fun or to pass the time. I'm teaching them to get a hold of a lot of money and crush their opponents. That is what we are trying to do here. So I'm not teaching things like, you know, Pot Limit Omaha Sit and Goes or Deuce to Seven Single Draw, which, you know, are nothing wrong with the games. I'm sure they're fine and good, but you cannot find games you can play consistently for medium and high stakes, which is why I really recommend you focus on either cash games or tournaments. Or if you do focus on Sit and Goes, realize you're going to have to transition out of them and, you know, they're good practice for final tables of tournaments, but not a whole lot else. So... I would recommend you probably play cash games in the beginning. I know a lot of people who play tournaments don't like to hear that. They want to play only tournaments, which is fine. If you're going to play tournaments, I'd recommend you play small field tournaments. There are a lot of tournaments online that have only 100 people in them. And 100 person tournaments are not going to have that much variance, at least compared to $1,000 tournaments, right? Or 1,000 thousand person tournaments. Because in 1,000 person tournaments, there can be a ton of variance. So what are some common pitfalls? Big however. They underline it in blue. Going back to our equation here. Double, 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 10 times. Seems easy. You have to understand that your edge will decrease as you move up. It just will. Back when I used to play sit and goes, I started off playing, well, actually, to be fair, I, uh, I'm not going to give you full story. It's going to waste your time. We already wasted enough time with the webcam issue today. I went back and I played Tiny Stakes Sit and Goes. And I had something like a 20% return on investment in $10 games, which is humongous. 20% ROI is like, you're just printing money in Sit and Goes land. By the time I got back up to the $500 games, I was winning at something like 3% return on investment. Three only. So I had my win rate divided by six as I moved up to the highest stakes games. And that's fine, as long as you realize what is actually happening here. Because to be fair, winning $15 per game is like pretty good money if you can play 20 games an hour, right? It's 300 bucks an hour. Nothing to be sad about. But you're going to have a lower win rate in terms of big blinds per hour or return on investment as you move up. That's just how it's going to happen. So let's say you are winning today at the 5 cent, 10 cent games at 12 big blinds per 100 hands. A, bit, a pretty good win rate online. If you moved up to... 25 cent, 50 cent, you may not even be a winner, right? So you have to figure out, is that fine, right? Realize you may not be as good at poker as you think you are. A lot of people think that if I'm going to win at this win rate at this stake, I'm going to win at the same win rate at the next stake. And you may, but you're probably not. It will always or almost always get decreased. So you have to make sure you are consistently studying and improving your skills, okay? Okay. If you do not study and you do not improve your skills, as you play against more serious poker players, inevitably, they're going to be better than your previous opponents, right? So you're going to have to figure out how to beat them and also realize they're probably devoting a substantial amount of time to win at poker. And you have to ask yourself, are you actually doing the things that you need to do to succeed? Next, you may not like putting in substantial volume. Our math equation there, presume we're putting in 40 hours a week for half of a year. You actually going to do that? Most people don't. They're lazy. They want to play on the weekends or for fun or whenever they feel like it for two hours a day. You're going to have a tough time making a whole lot of money if you put in two hours per day because it's going to take you way, 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 way more time. If you only put in 10 hours a week, now it's going to take you 100 weeks, right? If you only actually put in three hours a week, I don't even know how many it's going to take. Three, 300, 300 weeks. I don't even know how many years that is. That's too big for me to count. Okay? So, you want to make sure that you're actually putting in good volume. And next, most players are tempted to spend their bankroll. Back whenever I first started playing poker, I was playing a Tiny Stakes home game. And... It was, I'm trying to figure out, it, it doesn't really matter what the game is, but essentially every time I would win, I would take my money, I'd put it in a box, and I'd keep growing my money. And after a while, I had a box full of money. One of my other friends, the other very good poker player who was playing those games, 
Every time he would win, he would buy a new CD. You know what CDs are? For all of you young children, they had these discs. Kind of like DVDs, but they can only store a little bit of data. And you put them into this device and it plays music. Crazy, I know. This guy would spend all of his winnings on Eminem CDs, which was an old rapper or whatever he was. And after a while, I had a whole lot of money. And after a while, he had a bunch of music CDs that became obsolete a few years later. And I don't know what the guy's up to, but he's certainly not a high stakes professional poker player today. And that's unfortunate because he was actually a very good poker player, right? So why did he make not make it and why did I make it? It's because I did not spend my money on stuff. And look, there's nothing wrong with spending your money on stuff, but you have to realize that if you take money out of your bankroll, essentially, going back to this equation, every time you double up, if this number, instead of a $100 or $200, is $150, well, now you double your $200 to $300. Then you're 300 to 600, then 6 to 12, then 12 to 24, right? And imagine right here, you take out some money. Imagine you take out 400 bucks. Now you have $2,000. Your 2 goes to 4, your 4 goes to 8, your 8 goes to 16, your 16 goes to 32, your 32 goes to 64. You have to play. We have to double your bankroll a whole nother time to get 100K. And this only presumed this person took out how much? $450. $450 is all we let this person take out. That's nothing. So many people, every time they move up, they take out half or they take out all of it, <laughs> right? And they just never, ever, 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 ever move up. And that is a blunder because they win, but they spend all their funds. And I realize as you become a professional, you will naturally spend your funds because you got to pay for your expenses and your living, right? But whenever you're growing your bankroll, ideally you're not using this money to pay for expenses. That's not what you necessarily want to be doing. You want to be spent using this money to move up, right? I mean, I was very, I mean, to be fair, if you look at a lot of the best poker players in the world today, they all started when they were like 17, 18, 19 years old. And when you're 17, 18 or 19 years old, you don't have many distractions in life. Because you have no family. I mean, you have no like uh, significant other and kids. You don't have that yet usually. And you don't really have many expenses. Back whenever I was young, I had, I think my all of my expenses each month were like $1,400. I didn't do anything. I just played poker all day. So I literally spent $1,400 a month and I was making about $50,000 a month. It's pretty easy to grow a big bankroll when you're making literally $48,000 a month, right? Because I'm just not spending any money. But if I was where I am today, God knows how much money I spend today, $50,000 a month or something. Like It would be way more difficult, right? Because you spend more money as you inevitably have more dependence and more things happening in life and whatnot, right? So make sure you do not spend your funds. But seriously, it's actually that easy, but so many people don't want to do it. So many people want to try to get rich quick. Somebody asked earlier, are satellites a good way to try to make money? The answer is no. Assuming you're using your satellite winning to play into a bigger tournament. Because the problem with satellites, look, none of the online sites like me t saying this, but I don't care. They don't pay me any money. Students pay me money. I am highly incentivized to give all of you good advice. I am not shilling for any poker site here. Satellites are terrible for you. They're not just bad. They're terrible for you. I'm going to tell you why they're terrible for you. Let's say you're good at satellites, okay? Let's say you're playing a satellite where one in 10 people win a seat to the next level. Say you're playing a $50 satellite, 10% of the people get $500 to play a $500 tournament that has 1,000 people. Let's say you're really good at satellites, you actually win one in eight. So you're making an edge. You make some money in that, right? Fine, good. First things first, how much is your edge, actually? Well, it's got a calculator here, handy dandy calculator. Let's say you have to put in $55 a pop, 55 times eight equals $440 and you get 500 out of it, maybe 550, let's say, but then that 550 goes into rake, whatever. Let's say you have to put in five, you put in five, uh, you put in 440, you get back 550, that's what, 20% ROI. Fine, pretty good win rate. How much is that per hour? I don't know what it is, but it's gonna be like 10 bucks an hour, something like that. 
Then, the big problem is that most players who are good at satellites are terrible at tournaments. Not all, most. Because satellites highly incentivize you to sneak into the money. So why would you think that you're going to have an edge in a tournament that is 10 times the amount you normally would play with a structure you are not used to or a structure you have not studied substantially and in a game that has infinite variance, right? Because if, you're pl if you satellite your way into a thousand person tournament, how often do you actually get a good result? Let's say you cash even 15% of the time, right? One in eight. Well, seven out of eight times you get nothing. That means it's got a handy dandy calculator. Um, let's say you point, how do we even do this? Point, let's say you cash the satellite 20% uh, of the time, which you don't, but let's say you do. You cash the satellite 20% of the time, then you cash the tournament 15% of the time. That means you get a cash one out of, you get a cash 0.03% of the time. 0 0.1 or 1%, what am I saying here? 3% of the time you get a cash. One out of 30. There we go. I finally found it. One out of 30, you get a min cash, roughly. And then every once in a while, you get a big score. So this is assuming you're really good, by the way. If you cash one out of 30, that is not a good cash rate. You know how big of a bankroll you need if you're only going to get a minimum cash once in 30? I don't even know what the number is, but it's going to be a lot. You need a gigantic bankroll. And next, how often do you actually win? The answer is not very often in a thousand person tournament. So how often you get a really big score? I mean, I don't know. It depends on how many people are in the field, but I mean, the number's going to be quite tiny, right? It's going to be like one out of a thousand or something. You're going to get a real score once out of a thousand satellites you play, which is disastrous. Disastrous. Okay. Satellites are really bad for you. They are a great way to try to get rich quick. We talked about this at the start of the show. Poker is a horrible way to get rich quick. Satellites are a great way to try to get an experience. When you min cash, you get 20x your satellite buy-in. Yes, but how many times did you have to play the satellite to get in? You're thinking about individual entries. We already said you only cash your satellite 20% of the time, right? You're thinking about individual entries and not long-term. You must think about long-term. Okay. <sighs> yeah, you can turn five dollars into a million. You usually turn five dollars into zero, the vast majority of the time. Okay. So many people like to think that they won their way into a tournament or that they have a chance to try to get rich, and you do. You got a shot, but your shot's not very good, and you have to realize that if you're a fifty-dollar tournament player, and you decide that you're going to try to get lucky in your game or win, win in your games, then go play $500 games. You have to be the most insane, egotistical, dense person in the world to think that you as a $50 tournament player has a substantial edge in a $500 buy-in tournament that you are not bankrolled for. The nice thing about poker, by the way, is that assuming all of your money come for, comes from poker, unless you have some giant windfall where you like spike a tournament, your bankroll is pretty indicative of your skill level. Not 100% accurate, but it's pretty indicative to your skill level. So if you are not bankrolled for $500 tournaments, it means you're not good enough to beat $500 tournaments. Okay? How much of a bankroll do you need to play X game? Check out pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. Type right here. Oh my God, I can't type. Nothing's working today. Pokercoaching.com slash bankroll is the bankroll Bible. It'll tell you everything you need to know about bankroll. It's more like rank roll. <laughs> yeah, the bankroll equals your rank to some extent. I mean, look, if you spike a tournament right off the bat, then obviously not. Like when Chris Moneymaker turned his $25 into two and a half million or whatever it was. One million, two and a half million, who knows what it was. It doesn't make a difference. He um, recognized he is not a person who should be buying into tournaments with a two and a half million dollar bankroll, right? He's not all of a sudden qualified to be buying in directly to big tournaments. So what did he do? He was smart. He played smaller games and you know, he played some big games, some smaller games, whatever, but he was really smart about it and didn't just blow it all. 
So many players, though, they come into a lot of money and they think now all of a sudden they're properly skilled to win, um, which, which is the rough thing about tournaments. But in cash games, for example, your cash game bankroll, assuming you grew it all from poker and you didn't like have money from a job or something, your cash game back bankroll is going to be highly indicative of your skill level. Same thing with sit and goes. It's going to be highly indicative of your skill level. If you're listening to this despite not wanting to hear it. Sorry. I mean, look, the great thing about this is it's actually not that hard to win money. Get to where you can win. All you can do is make a dollar an hour. One dollar per hour, everybody. Take your one, turn it into two. Take a hundred, turn it into two hundred. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Double, 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 double. Double it 10 times. It only takes half a year. And you can have $100,000 in your pocket if you are skilled and you work hard and you put in volume. But again, nobody wants to do it. It's hard to win consistently, though. No, it's not. It's actually very easy to win consistently. It is very, very easy to win consistently. I mean, I've done it and I've taught plenty of students to do it. But most people don't want to actually sit down and grind. And when you say it's hard to win consistently, that tells me either you're not putting in good volume or you're playing in very high variance games. I say it right here off the bat. Where, where do I say this? Ideally, keep variance low on the literal first slide. Okay? Keep variance low. How do you keep variance low? Don't play games with a lot of variance. Don't play Pot Limit Omaha. Don't play tournaments with a thousand people. Right? Don't play games where your edge is tiny. These are all things that you can do to keep variance low that will result in your bankroll kind of going straight up. I mean, whenever I was young, my bankroll pretty much went straight up. I mean, look, I had downswings. Everybody has downswings. But luckily, volume cures variance at the end of the day. Is it better to grow a bankroll through cash games or tournaments? I literally just said it here. Where did I say it? I said it somewhere in here. Something about sit and goes. Here you go. Cash games and sit and goes will result in a consistent climb. Tournaments will have lots of variance. Okay. How do you keep variance low in aggressive, splashy Texas cash games? Oh my God, it's super low in those games. In games where you have a big edge, variance is naturally low. Because if your edge is gigantic, you just mostly win. And yeah, sure, you're going to get spiked on seven times in a row sometimes, but who cares? Hopefully you're keeping an adequate 40, 30, 50 buy-in bankroll, whatever it is, right? I think a lot of people are really stuck on the short term. From, from reading people's comments on Twitter, they're like, oh man, I played this weekend and I got three out or two times. I'm so, the, the game is rigged and I'm so unlucky. But it's like, are you kidding? Are you absolutely kidding me? Because who cares about one session or two sessions or 10 sessions or 50 sessions? You read the sit and goes are solved. Indeed, we did that a long time ago. How do you find an edge in those games versus tough regs? Don't play tough regs. Oh my gosh, I'm, you guys are tilting me here. You guys are tilting me here. Maybe you weren't here at the beginning. I very clearly stated, sit and goes are great at the small and medium stakes. They are terrible for the high stakes because the game is very, very difficult to beat. So sit and goes are great to turn a little bit of money into some money. Then you have to transition. I literally said, you will have to transition to cash games or tournaments from sit and goes. You cannot make good money from sit and goes. We killed those games back in 2006. If you all did not know, know this, I had a poker training site in 2006. Me and two of the other best sit-and-go players in the world. It was called Sit-and-Go Icons because we were egotistical children. And um, we didn't realize how easy sit-and-goes were. <laughs> and we made some videos and then they, the games died. The games completely died. Because it turns out it's not that hard to win at sit-and-goes. We showed everybody how to win at sit-and-goes and then the games were dead. Then we all had a transition. Oh, by the way, this is maybe not written here, but uh, don't play for things like Rakeback. If all of your money comes from something like Rakeback, like happened to all the high stakes sit-and-go players, you're not going to get paid your last few payments. That's how Rakeback goes. You never get paid your last few payments. Or maybe not never, but rarely get paid your last few payments. Um, like PokerStars, they did this thing where they took away the VIP program for people who grinded for like eight months or something. The way that program works is you grind for a year, then you get your bonus the next year. These people grinded eight months, lost money because they're all playing with like a minus 1% return on investment, expecting to get it back fully because they said they would. And then they did not get paid. So now they're just all out a bunch of money. Um, 
I've had plenty of rakeback agents for various sites. They pay until they don't. Et cetera, et cetera. At what stakes do sit and go stop being profitable since it is tough to beat the good players? I don't know. Get in there and figure it out yourself, right? The great thing about poker is you can put in 40 or 50 or 100 hours and know, or kind of know, if you're winning or losing. I'm not playing $30 sit and goes and $50 sit and goes, $100 sit and goes. I don't know what the number is, but you can figure it out and it depends site to site. So anyway, all you got to do is find a game where you have a small edge, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. That's really it, but nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to put in substantial volume because they're lazy. Can a profitable micro stakes player online beat one two live? They're definitely very different games. But probably, if you can beat any stakes online, you can probably beat one two live. The problem is one two live requires a much bigger bankroll than five cent and ten cents, right? Five cent ten cent requires like four hundred dollars, whereas one two live requires like three thousand dollars, right? Or more. But no, I mean, you should be able to beat that for a pretty decent amount of money. All right, so once we get a hold of some money, now I want to transition and I want to talk about how do you make $100,000 a year from poker? Online cash is unbeatable. Well, if you're not very good, it's unbeatable. <laughs> Everything's unbeatable if you're not very good. All right, how do you make $100,000 a year from poker? Same thing. Find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. Simple as that. So. It's again a math problem. Let's say you got your $100,000 and you know now that you want to play, let's say 40 hours each week for 48 weeks a year. I would say this is a pretty lazy schedule, but it's more than what most poker players did. Um, back whenever I was playing at Bellagio frequently, consistently, I would put in about 70 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, right? If you know how to make 100,000 a year from poker, why are you here grifting? You all may not know this, but I make a lot more than 100K a year. All right. So anyway, this is a math problem here, right? 40 hours a week, 48 weeks a year, 1,920 hours. You take 100K, you divide it by 1,920 equals 52 bucks an hour. 40 hours a week seems like a lot. Yeah, well, look. It's a full-time job. 40 hours a week is definitely a full-time job. So take a second, think about it. Where can you make $52 per year? Well, live cash games are easy. At most live cash games, up to something like 510, you can make roughly 10 big blinds per hour, which is a gigantic win rate. It's like 30 big blinds per 100. It's absurd, right? So... That is doable if you're a strong player. And very importantly, very importantly, it is easy to put in substantial volume. You can also make 50 bucks an hour at $1,000 buy-in tournaments, give or take, but it's tough to put in substantial volume because how long do you actually play each tournament on average? The answer is not all that long. Each tournament on average, you may play like four hours or something. And if you play the tournament, you bust a tournament and there's no other tournament to play, you're just done and you gotta go home, which is kind of lame. Now you may say, I can just go play cash games then, which you can, but then you're splitting your skill set, you're splitting, you're splitting your study time and that's usually not ideal. Greetings from Italy, hello, I love Italy. Italy is a fun place. So, we say MTTs, you gotta account for travel costs and time. Play a place where there's no travel costs in time, which would be somewhere like Florida, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, etc. But anyway, um, I would definitely recommend cash games again for this because most localities have a 2-5 game that runs decently often, especially if you live at a, by a casino. Again, ideally, if you are a professional poker player, you live where there are games, right? You should not live in, uh, let's say, New York City because there's no games. <laughs> So you want to make sure you play in a spot where you can consistently put in volume. Remember, I said it right here. Find a game you can beat. Play it a lot. Click the like and subscribe button, as people say. I would appreciate it. Why not? Thank you very much. Find a game you can beat. Play it a lot and keep a proper bankroll. If you do not play a lot, you will not succeed. Okay?
Know what I say here? It'll be tough to play, or it'll be tough to win $100,000 a year consistently at the smaller stakes than $1,000 buy-in tournaments or 2-5 no limit, unless you're putting in a lot of volume. Is insert any game beatable? The things that make a game beatable are, well, the things that determine if a game is beatable is simply the rake structure. And that's it, right? Like if they're raking a lot, then no. If they're raking a little bit, then probably. Also, how bad your opponents are, right? If your opponents are equally as good as you or there's no skill in the game because it's all luck, like flipping coins or something, then there's no edge, right? Does anyone know of a California casino that takes percent make rates instead of a drop? Um, you'd probably rather them take a drop. The drop's actually not all that bad in California casinos, especially, well, at least not at like the major ones, unless, especially if they're like, giving you food and drinks and perks and stuff like that. Like, um, I used to play a lot at Commerce and the bike, and I think they would take, like, $10 per half hour, but they'd give you all the food you want. So I'd just, like, go there and eat, like, a buffet. <laughs> Sheriff Cod said he bought a stake of me in the $25,000 tournament. Yeah, so on, on Pocket Fives, I think they just changed their name. I don't know what their name is yet. On Pocket Fives, I'm selling 10% of my action in the upcoming $25,000 buy-in, Poker Stars, whatever the thing's called, PSPC, in the Bahamas. I'm excited to go there. The most anybody can buy is 25 bucks. We're giving everybody a little bit of a sweat. Everybody gets a little bit of a sweat. There's also a $10,000 turbo at the end. I figure I'll give everybody a sweat in that one too. I think you can buy $10 pieces in that one. Only 10%. There you go. Your daughter says she wants to be a YouTube star. Good luck with that. Who is Jonathan Little? Yeah, exactly. It's fine. I'm not so popular among the young girls. Maybe maybe next life. Not that young girls. You know what I mean. All right. Common pitfalls. Four pros. You guys are going to get me. Everyone's going to be canceled here talking about children now. All right. Most people, again, do not actually want to put in volume. Okay. Also, you may have a difficult time finding games to play. This is This is a big one right here. Because if you live in, let's say, I don't know, Cincinnati. Imagine you live in Cincinnati and they have one or two casinos, right? There may not actually be a 2-5 game running when you want to play, right? And that may mean that you have to move. That may mean that you have to cultivate your own game. I mean... I give some people an advice around around this region where there's not any cash games. I mean, like, maybe you should run your own game at your house. You know, don't break the laws. Don't do anything illegal, but have a game. You take no rake. Maybe people chip in money for food and drinks or whatever. And you play a game at your house once a week. Figure that out, right? And, I mean, if you can get an extra eight or ten hours worth of play in, that's very valuable. Donna says there's no casino anywhere near you, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you gotta move or you gotta, you gotta figure out some, something to do, right? Aren't online cash games an option? Sure, but online cash games are much tougher than live cash games. Um, also, online is um, rough for Americans, at least right now, because most of the sites that let Americans play are not licensed, not regulated, and... Not legal in America. That's a bit of a problem. So, thought, speaking of traveling to play the casino at the casino, someone asked me the other day, they have two casinos they can go to. One is, let's say, three hours away, but the game's a little bit better, and one is an hour away, but they don't really like the casino and the games are a little bit tougher. Which should you go to? I mean, my answer is probably go to the close one. My answer is probably just go to the close one. And the reason is because... You get to put in four extra hours of play per session, right? And also you don't have to sit in the car doing, you know, presumably kind of wasting your time. And that's that's going to be beneficial for you to just be in there playing and getting in volume. Was Cincinnati a random place? I was thinking about casinos I've been to that had like one casino or two casinos that I've been to and I know they don't they didn't have like a ton of games running. Right? So Goodbye. Um, so yeah, anyway, I like, I like going, I, I like thinking about places where I have been that I know 
the games are there, but they're also not consistent, right? And you have to find a, find a way to put in volume. Now, to be fair, maybe you can only play 30 hours a week of 2-5, but then you can play 10 or 20 hours a week of 1-3. Probably fine, right? Kevin says, JL beat you to banning him. You know, look, I... Some people think that uh, you're supposed to be able to say whatever you want on the internet, but you have to realize, this stream is like my house. You cannot come into my house and start essentially lying to people and making stuff up and speaking ignorantly. I don't like people coming to my house and do that. My physical house. And, you know, this is kind of like my real house. I want this to be a kind, respectful community where people want to improve each other's skills. Just like I want in my house with my wife and kids. Right? We're all trying to improve each other. Whenever the kids start acting up, they get in trouble. They get timed out. They get, they get a little ban hammer. They have to go to their room. They're banned from the rest of the house for a few minutes. On the internet, I'm a little bit more um, aggressive. I'll ban you for life because I don't really care. <laughs> if you come into my house and you speak nonsense, I will ban you for life. Good game. Enjoy yourself. Fortunately for everybody, the internet's a big place. All right. Common pitfalls. You don't want to put in hours. You may not be able to put in a good volume. You may not be as good as you think you are. This is the one that's tough for a lot of people because they think because they can win in some game that they should be able to win in all games. Or if they start having a downswing, they think, oh, I'm just unlucky. But maybe the game has changed. Especially in live games, the composition of the game is very important. Um, you're going to find that like nights and weekends, usually the composition is way better than early morning games, right? Like when I used to play at Bellagio, I'd go there and I'd play 10.20 every morning. I'd show up at 11.30 because the game would start at about uh, 11.45. And it'd be me, one other good pro, and seven very old men. And that's what you had to do to make sure you were in a game that you knew you could actually get in and play. And I did not expect to have much of a win rate in that game. Maybe 100 bucks an hour or something, which is, you know, fine and good. It's nothing, it's not terrible. But at the same time, I was mainly there for the ability to be in the game later, right? Which I thought was very, very valuable. And it was, because otherwise you wouldn't get to play until six o'clock or something. So I'd rather play in a bad game for five or six hours and then get to play later than just miss out on that five or 600 bucks, right? Did you ever straddle from under the gun? Probably not. Straddling's pretty bad if you're good at poker, unless the sacks are just incredibly deep. I mean, it's always bad. Every time you straddle, you're torching your money from out of position. How do you work your way up to play in Bobby's room? What would be your main game plan if that is the end goal? Bobby's room is a funny, funny goal because it's like, it's mostly mixed games. And it's kind of hard to actually work your way up to it because the games are gigantic. Um, that said, I would recommend finding a bunch of mixed games and getting good at them because that, that's how you play in there. We need to advertise the study groups more. We have poker coaching study groups. We have them for cash games and tournaments. Louis Philippe is in charge of that. He is here today. And look, if you find a group of like-minded people who are working hard to improve all of your skills together, you will thrive. Back when I was young, I had a group of people around me who were working hard to improve our skills. We had uh, Dave Benefield, Phil Galfond, Tom Dwan, Shannon Shore. I mean, we, we talked about poker all the time. A bunch of other people. I'm not just going to go down the laundry list. Well, Andrew Robel. Andrew Robel was in charge of the Ship at Halabalas. They wrote a book about us. Can you believe that? About the nonsense we did. Um, but we all worked together and, and improved each other's skills. And now we're all very good at poker. Who'd have thought, right? And that is what the poker coaching study sessions do. They find people like that who get together, work hard together, make friends, and they learn. There's a lot of value in learning. Who'd have thought that if you get together with people and all you do is discuss getting good at something, You'll probably get good at that something. Kelly shipped over 7,000 bucks this weekend. Good job, good work. Is 3% rake at 2.5 okay? I don't know. 5% um, uncapped is pretty pretty unbeatable. 3%, I don't know. Yeah, get in the Poker Coaching Discord. Why is straddling bad if position is so valuable? When you straddle under the gun, you're out of position. You're out of position and you're putting in more money. If you put in money out of position, it's bad. The only two positions you lose money at at the poker table are the small blind and the big blind. And if you put another blind there, which is what a straddle is, 
you lose even more money, right? Putting in money blind is usually not a good idea. <laughs> Let's, is, this a, is this a genius thought that I give to all of you? You should probably look at your cards before you put in money. You're saying in your game, you have a button straddle. Button straddles are also not great unless you're super deep stacked because you're putting in money without looking at your cards. Imagine you had to put in money on the button. Is that good? Like, not really. And that is how straddling, I don't, I mean, I don't know what weird straddles you all are playing with. A typical under the gun straddle does not make you the button. It makes you the third blind. Now there are things like Mississippi straddles or button straddles. Sometimes the, the action goes around you. Sometimes it doesn't. Depends on your casino, right? In general though, you don't want to put in money from, you don't want to put in money without looking at your cards. Especially if your opponents are not great, right? See, if your opponents are not great, you'd like, you don't need to build the pot. Also, you got to realize the straddle makes the pot bigger, which decreases your post-flop edge. By straddling, you're saying, I think that I don't have an edge after the flop. So I want to make the pot big pre-flop. So the only time that makes sense is whenever you're super duper deep stacked and can't get in stacks otherwise. You want to make the stacks a little bit shorter. Like say you're playing a thousand big blinds deep and you know your opponents are never putting in a thousand, but they might put in 500, then it makes sense. All right, next. If you try to move up, you may fail, costing you time and money because inevitably you do want to move up. Inevitably, you do want to move up because, well, I say it here, $100,000 is not what it used to be. You have to pay taxes. What's it want me to change to? You must pay taxes. You must pay taxes. Assuming you're in America. Um, look, you got to move up because if you're making 100000 bucks a year, it's fine and good and you'll be, you'll be okay. But I do not want to teach all of you all to be okay. All right, I want all of you to absolutely crush it. And if you make $100,000 and you have to pay 40,000 of it to taxes, well, now you're only making 60,000 bucks a year, which is, again, fine and good, but not amazing. Oh yeah, Louis Philippe says, congrats to Justin Saliba. I think he took fifth place in the $5,000 buy-in tournament at Borgata. Justin's been crushing it. He won the 25K the other day. I had a nice little piece of him in that. That was good. He won the 25K in Florida. Then he uh, final tabled the 25K in the win. I had a little piece of that too. And uh, then he took fifth place in the $5,000 tournament yesterday for what, 300 something thousand bucks? I had no piece of him in that one. Such is life. It's actually funny. He texted me the day the tournament was starting. He said, hey, are you going to Borgata? I'm like, no, are you? He's like, yeah, I'm flying in right now, last second. <laughs> Winning all the poker tournaments will make you play or make you want to play all the poker tournaments. All right, next. You're probably gonna need health insurance. I think in America, they require you to have health insurance, which is kind of lame. Well, I'm not gonna say lame, look, not a political thing. I don't think you should have to pay insurance if you're willing to take the risk. Now, obviously you can't go around hurting other people, of course, whatever. You probably need health insurance. Next, you need to pay a save money for retirement, okay? Because you're not gonna be able to play poker forever. Pretty much no one, again, there are exceptions, pretty much no one plays poker with a high win rate indefinitely. I'm sure all of you are thinking, Doyle Brunson plays and he wins. You sure? And citing a few other players. And I'm telling you, there are few players who are older than like 65 who play at the high stakes successfully. And most of those who do play, who look successful, I know they're not. And that's tough. It's a tough pill to swallow because you think you can do it forever. But you can't. Now, you may say, what if I'm, I stay sharp and I study and all this, right? Maybe. I guess I'll let you know in 40 years. <laughs> but uh, I would recommend you save for retirement. I'd recommend you put some money away. Bill Klein makes a lot of money from poker. Bill Klein gives away all of his money. I don't know if you all know this. Whenever Bill Klein plays a tournament, if he loses, whatever the buy-in is, he gets that amount of money and gives it to charity. If Bill Klein wins in the tournament, he takes all that money he wins and gives it to charity. When he plays a cash game, he takes all that money he wins and gives it to charity. <laughs> Bill Klein has all the money. And he's giving it all away. It's a lot of fun. Good job, good work. But no, Bill's like, Bill is a good example of an exception to some extent, right? 
I mean, he's he's a very sharp guy, very good at poker, very good at golf, apparently. There was a day, the other day, we were playing a $25,000 buy-in tournament at Aria, and he shot a hole-in-one at the golf course, and then came and won the $25,000 buy-in tournament. <laughs> he's an anomaly, you know? But uh, look, there's anomalies all over the place, and that's the problem with a lot of people, is they look at the anomalies and they think that that's the norm. Right? Bill is an exceptional human, and most people are not exceptional humans. I don't think I'm anything exceptional. You're probably not either. Hate to break it to you. So don't think that these rules that seem to be pretty clearly in place don't apply to you. This goes back to people thinking they're better than they are at poker. Why would you think that? You have no reason to think that. All right, next. Save money for retirement. Next. You need to have funds set aside in case things go poorly. Things can go poorly in all sorts of ways. You can go on a massive downswing, which may happen. You can uh, break your leg, <clears throat> not want to go play poker for a little bit. You can get sick. One of your friends can get sick. Whatever, right? Things can happen that will make you not play as much poker. And you need to have a fund set aside for a rainy day. And that's, that's important. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of poker players think, okay, I need, let's say, 40 buy-ins. I have my 40 buy-ins for live cash games. They get it. Things are going well enough. They're winning money. But then they get sick and they have to go to the hospital for three months. You don't work for three months, that's a problem. Poker's not like a regular job where if you don't work, you still get paid. Or you have various workers' insurances and whatnot, right? Um, you gotta realize that. You have to realize that, that you need money set aside in case things go poorly. <coughs> and next, you need to strive to move up stakes, which also takes money. You need to save money, not spend it all. You need to save a lot of money to use that money to make more money in the future. I mean, it's always kind of, um, it hits me it hits me a little bit hard whenever I like go back to Bellagio. And I, you know, I used to play 5 to no limit, right? And I see the players that I played with 15 years ago still there playing 5 to no limit today. And I'm sure they have a good win rate. But inflation happens. 5 10 today is like 2 5 nowadays in terms of utility of the money, right? So you always have to be moving up because the dollar is getting deflated. To some extent. And that's that's important to recognize. You must move up. Because if you stay at the same stake, your money is worth less as time moves forward. So you, you have to move up inevitably. What's the go-to book for cash games? Check out... Where is it? Where is it? Mastering Small Stakes, No Limit Hold'em. Yeah, Mastering Small Stakes, No Limit Hold'em. Or my cash game masterclass at pokercoaching.com. Check out the cash game masterclass. It's about... 45 hours long or so. Lots of quizzes. It's very interactive and will make you good at cash games. I have to go because there is a poker coaching webinar starting in three minutes. I should probably look at that before we start the show. If you're a poker coaching member, head over there, log in, get in the dashboard, hop right in, and we are going to go to a pretty interesting spot um, in a cash game, actually, where button raises, we three bet small blind, they call. We're going to be talking about what happens when you split your bet sizes, what happens whenever you use only a big bet size on the flop, when you use only a small bet size on the flop, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be it for today. You look forward to Lexi's book. Am I helping out? I'm letting her write it. I'm, I have to edit it. I, uh, you all may not know this, but I do a, a decent amount of editing and revision and curation of all the books at DMB Poker for the most part. Not all the books, but a lot of the books at DMB Poker, and I will definitely be checking out Lexi's. You had to start online today when I play cash games or tournaments. We already said that. I would be playing cash games. Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. Happy New Year. We showed some math earlier. All I have to do is put in 40 hours a week for half a year, and you can turn 100 bucks into 100,000. Takes a lot of grind. Takes a lot of persistence. Takes a lot of study. Takes a lot of discipline. But I have full faith that all of you can do it. Good luck. Have fun. Thank you for being here. Click the like and subscribe button. I'll talk to all of you next time.